from CGTN headquarters in Beijing, this is The Hub with Wang Guan. Hello there and welcome to The Hub. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. The Boao Forum for Asia 2022 kicked off yesterday in China's Hainan province. Post-COVID economic recovery takes center stage as the world faces increasing uncertainties, especially with the resurgence of the COVID virus and the Russia-Ukraine conflict. President Xi Jinping of China delivered a much-awaited speech this morning via video link to try to ease some of these concerns. He called for making Asia an anchor for world peace, a powerhouse for global growth, and a new pace setter for international cooperation. He also proposed, he did actually a few years ago, a global security initiative, and he revisited this concept this morning. What to expect from the Boreal Forum for Asia this year? And can Asia kickstart the world economic recovery? To answer some of these questions, I'm very pleased to be joined this morning by Marcos Toloijo, president of the New Development Bank based in Shanghai. Good morning, Marcos. Great to have you with us. Um, we've heard from the Chinese president this morning. Anything sticks out uh, for you? Hi, Guan. It's a pleasure to join the show again. Well, I think uh, if we take a look at the past uh, 75 years of global economic history, we will see that no matter what civilization you're coming from or what is the economic model that you embrace, but uh, if you think about countries like Germany, Japan, uh, uh, China, Chile, uh, Spain since 1982, Singapore, uh, South Korea, all of these countries that have experienced extraordinary economic growth and, and a steady uh, pace towards prosperity, Globalization has been one of the driving forces. More global trade as a percentage of GDP, openness to foreign direct investments have been the pillars of economic success over the past seven and a half decades. And I don't see why, uh, say, the resurgence of the pandemic or geopolitical tensions or even global inflation that has picked up uh, in recent uh, uh, years should be uh, a way to uh, create an alternative to more globalization, to more uh, international cooperation, to increased flows of investment. So keeping the economy, the global economy open is to keep the global economy going. So if this message is broadcast mm -hmm. and embraced by countries even in difficult times, such as the one that we're living in, then I think we have a much better chance of achieving economic success. But Marcos, let's face it, many politicians, some scholars would point out that we're living in the real world where uh, you know, there is identity politics, where some people do lose out uh, amidst uh, globalization. Uh, and they argue that the benefits of globalization goes to those very top, a very select few. Um, how would you address those concerns? I think, once again, based upon recent economic experience, we can basically divide nations in two blocks. Those blocks of nations who have geared towards themselves, who have closed out the global economy, who have pursued protectionist policies, who have become uh, nations that have become more insular, and their economic performance has been lagging behind. Whereas those countries that have opened up more to global trade, who have welcomed more foreign direct investments, who went out into the world to conquer global markets have been much more successful. I think the risk of deglobalization today, as you said, is, is very high, but uh, I think it does not stand the test of time or the test of real uh, experience. I know that there's going to be a, a bigger uh, push towards, for example, regional economic integration. Some people say that the new fashion for globalization, which will be regionalization, but I think uh, common standards, common interests, uh, either at, under the umbrella of the WTO or if you're talking about a new wave of multilateralism where you, you come with things like, for example, uh, reduced access, uh, reduced tariffs, reduced quota, uh, common patterns for the exchanges. Once again, I understand that the, these common interests merging together via globalization are the most important tools for economic success. And even under the current difficulties, this trend will, is not going to change. And those who embraced a more of a protectionist approach, who close out, who have, will, will have less chances to become successful. All right, fair enough. Chinese President Xi, Xi Jinping actually called for making Asia an anchor for world peace, a powerhouse for global growth. How do you see that happening? 
Well, one once again, I mean, if you if you compare Asia to other regions of the world over uh, over the past uh, three to four uh, decades, you will see that Asia has become indeed the geoeconomic meridian of of the globe. Uh, it's not only because of the early success of Japan and the success of South Korea, but now with the extraordinary economic performance of China over the past 30 to uh, 35 years. You have uh, the bulk of global population here. It's, it's the manufacturing hub of the world. And now with this evolution towards the fourth industrial revolution, you have many individual players among the nation states in the region who are also leading uh, the race towards, uh, for example, intellectual property, uh, tech intensiveness. And this may actually mean a very uh, uh, good uh, news for the rest of the world. I take, for example, the region where I'm from, which is Latin America. As Asia rises, some of the con traditional comparative advantages of Latin America stand out in the production of food, in the, pro in the production of, of, of those uh, uh, goods that are going to cater to uh, the, the rising uh, uh, population and the rising economic status for Asia. And that's why you see the levels of trade and the levels of investment going up among e regions like Asia and Latin America and even Asia in Africa. So I think it's, 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 a, it's actually a, 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 good new, a good piece of yeah. news and a piece of news that brings about more opportunities for other regions in the world. I mean, speaking of which, uh, I can tell you many Chinese would say that they cannot get enough uh, of uh, Brazilian coffee beans or, or Brazilian Equatorian seafood, to say the least, among other things. Now, let's talk about your bank, the new development bank. It was formerly known as the BRICS Development Bank. Can you remind our viewers uh, the missions, the goals of your bank, and specifically what have you been doing over the years? Uh, some, maybe some of the concrete projects you have been doing uh, that is, you know, aligning with these goals. Yeah. So I think when when the leaders of the, of the BRICS nations uh, looked at the global economic picture, they said, "Well, uh, there is one piece that's missing out there, which is a development institution directed towards the needs of emerging uh, economies." So only uh, eight nine years ago, having a development bank for emerging economies like the one we, we have right now was a faraway dream, but that dream has come true. The new development bank started operations in 2015, and almost seven years into this history, the uh, institution now features a portfolio of book of projects of about $30 billion. We have more than 80 projects that span the four corners of the world in areas like uh, energy, water, uh, sanitation, the digital economy, urban mobility. Uh, railways, uh, roads, airports. So basically every single uh, sector of infrastructure has been touched by the new uh, development bank. And it's not only about the amount of money that we mo mo mobilize and approve, but it's also the nature of the project, the kind of development impact they generate, how they change people's lives for uh, the better. So uh, we, we can consider the new development bank, even though recent times have been extraordinarily uh, challenging with, you know, the biggest economic crisis of the past 100 years, the biggest health-related crisis of the past 100 years, geopolitical tensions, although there, are, there is this environment, there is this atmosphere, which is very challenging. We have been able to, to, to make it through and we'll continue to do so. And then talking about development, sustainable development is, is a big part of it. Uh, how is the NBD, the NDB actually, supporting the green economy and investments related to the environment and you know, social governance? Yeah, I think uh, we, should, we should approach the issue of the green economy from a very broad uh, perspective. So if you're, if, you're, uh, if you're talking about improving the overall conditions of, of, of people, after all, the most important element of uh, sustainable development is, is the people. Uh, so if they if they work in a cleaner environment, it have, if they have more access to water, if they are if if they are uh, say equipped with uh, with basic sanitation, even though these are not areas that directly relate, for example, to to uh, what you could call a, a green economy, it ends up uh, creating a very positive um, uh, effect between the relation on the relationship between humans and. Um, and, uh, and urban development. Can you give us so an example so of the green development project for the next doing? five years? 
for the next five years. Oh, so about a, about a quarter that everything we're investing is, is directly related to the green economy. So solar energy, uh, wind energy, uh, mitigation, improving uh, uh, water treatment, uh, adopting uh, new technologies that allow for low carbon emissions in urban transportation uh, in, in, in Brazil, in China, uh, in India. So in, in different, uh, 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 say, member countries, we apply projects that are green. And going forward in the next cycle of five years, our strategy is to reach up to 40 percent of investments that are uh, somewhat related to, to the green economy. So we absolutely committed. It's part of our core mission to have sustainable development and the green economy as a direction to everything that we invest in. You know, Marcos, you know this better than I do. There are some uh, you know, skepticists, um, you know, naysayers about the merits of multilateral institutions, uh, banks included. And on top of that, we already have numerous multilateral banks ranging from the Asian Development Bank to the AIIB. Uh, what's unique about NDB? You know, Guan, in the uh, late 1990s, I worked at the United Nations in New York. I was posted at the, uh, uh, the mission of my country, Brazil, to the UN. And, and, and then you get confronted with, uh, with the difficulties of multilateralism, the different political interests, the different economic perspectives. Sometimes things are slow. Sometimes they're too bureaucratic. But at the end of the day, your conclusion is that all of the other alternatives to multilateralism are worse. Multilateral is the best equipment that you have to solve problems that are global in nature. And when you talk about, for example, the infrastructure needs of the emerging world, even if you put together all of the development banks, all of them combined, from, from the World Bank to the Asian Development Bank, the New Development, if you put them all them combined, they only count for about, uh, say, 5% of everything that the emerging uh, markets need in terms of infrastructure. So the more multilateral institutions you have there, the better. We're not in competition with each other. We're actually complementing each other. We're like different musicians in the same orchestra. The focus of the New Development Bank, of course, is infrastructure and sustainable development. So we are part of a, of a bigger family trying to address these problems. And of course, mobilization of resources is something that we contribute to the solution, but also ideas, uh, uh, projects, uh, the, the, the expertise that we have. We are a very lean uh, and, and agile uh, uh, institution. So the New Development Bank has a very important role to play in, in how the 21st global economy is being shaped. And finally, Marco, since you are in Boao, Hainan province, attending the Boao Asian Forum, let me ask you about the Boao Bo Forum itself. How do you see the forum, you know, in not just pooling wisdoms and opinions and views, but in perhaps offering more concrete action plans uh, to address some of these pressing issues we're facing? Yeah, I mean, if, if, you, were, if you were to sort of scan some of the problems that we have uh, today, Guan, like you have an increase in monetary supply that leads to inflation. You have an increase in international protectionism that leads to, uh, say, uh, uh, economic performance that is far from optimal. You have an increase in geopolitical tensions, but you have a decrease in international cooperation. So what the what the Boal Forum is, is is great for is having people from all over the world come together. So cooperation is there, collaboration is there, and it's because you're bringing those different perspectives together that concrete actions may actually be thought of and implemented going forward. So it's a very important tool for economic recovery and for better understanding, which is at the core of uh, how multilateralism and international cooperation should play out. Marcos Tlaijo, president of the New Development Bank, thank you so much for joining us. Great to pick your mind. My pleasure, Guan. Thank you so much. Great. You've been watching The Hub on CGTN with me, Wang Guan. I'll be right back after the break. Now, welcome back. Chinese President Xi Jinping proposed a global security initiative, and he revisited this concept this morning during his video address to the Boao Forum that is taking place. Now, there are so many things going on in this world, uh, the Ukraine-Russia conflict, the economic recovery. The goal of China's foreign policy and its domestic policy, according to the Chinese president, is to stay committed to the vision of common, comprehensive, cooperative, 
and sustainable security. For more discussions on this and many other, many other issues we have with us today, Einar Tengen, political and economic affairs commentator, and Professor Liu Baocheng, director of the Center for International Business Ethics from the University of International Business and Economics. Um, great to have you with us. It has been a while since all three of us are sitting. Yeah, uh, in the well, studio. Well, luckily we have the source. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, um, let's get to it. President Xi's address this morning. Anything sticks out for you, Professor Liu? I think the uh, some people may say, okay, you know, you already talked about some of the notions in previous occasions, but now it is very important to reiterate on these very important notions because now we are facing far more challenges than uh, before, and right now global uh, deceleration of economic growth and actually there are uh, more and more people are really you know suffering from hunger and then you know the regional conflict is being escalated and then you know, the pandemic is still looming large over many other countries for lack of vaccination so uh, and then we have to address a long-term issue between uh, economic growth and lifestyle versus the climate change which threatens the, uh, the small earth that are over uh, 7 billion people are really inhabitants. So therefore, you know, how we can really, you know, uh, these grand notions be translated into actual action and people can be really to buy in. So this is uh, a alarm uh, to everybody that are engaged and particularly for uh, those politicians and also business leaders to think twice of what they are doing now. Mm -hmm. Einer, the Chinese president said that Asia should be an anchor for world peace, a powerhouse for global growth, and a new pace setter for international cooperation. Do you see that happening? Well, it's already happened. Uh, you know, if you start looking at Asia as a region, it's uh, half the world economic output in terms of manufacturing. It's uh, just under 50 percent in terms of the world's GDP. Uh, largest markets. Uh, out there, and it's been growing consistently faster than anywhere else in the in the world. So yes, uh, if you start looking for a future, and you know you can tell by the FDI numbers, uh, foreign direct investment, uh, it's still pouring into Asia. Uh, there are concerns, uh, but the concerns are greater now about Europe, especially with the Ukrainian crisis, uh, the U.S. and the economic walls, long-arm long jurisdiction, things like that. Right now, it's not. Uh, it's a very difficult time for businessmen to invest because you have so much uh, you know, uncertainty out there and business people like the certainty. So right now, if you start looking at the world, uh, Asia is definitely the most certain place that you can look. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Professor Liu, you talked about buy-ins from the Chinese business people, the Chinese consumers of you know, the messages that we've been hearing, you know, cooperation, uh, stimulating growth. How do you think the Buao Forum can perhaps address the issue of making more, uh, let's say, expats and people living in other parts of the world to have more buy-ins of the Chinese concept of cooperation, you know, common prosperity, so on and so forth? Well, uh, the uh, narrative used to be monopolized by the Western world uh, for the whole world, uh, for the for the whole world, and now. Uh, you know, people talk, talk about uh, so many years about the North and South issue. It seems that uh, the uh, North uh, world is expected to give more sympathy and uh, practical aid and development for those underdeveloped countries. But now Asia stand out. Actually, as the emerging economy, some of them are really in the third world. Uh, but they stand out over the past 20 years, you know, to serve as a locomotive for global growth. And the other is the integrity uh, of the Asian culture or Oriental culture that really serve as quite a coercion to bond these people. We have some, uh, you know, border problems. We still have, may have some of the grudges, but we are able to solve it in a peaceful manner. To maintain stability is really the foundation for pro prosperity. And also now we ha also have very structured relationship you know, the uh, uh, CPTPP is underway, and then the uh, RCEP is uh, uh, also playing a very important role. So only by, you know, uh, teaming together to give people a better life, and people will have the confidence, and this type of confidence and this type of drive will be able to proliferate the spirit and the ethos 
around the world. So yeah, that's a showcase. Hopefully there will be a, a moment and time where there will be a critical mass so that uh, you know, the tide of history, the tide of opinions can be shifted, uh, although it may take a time, but maybe hope that it will happen slowly but surely. Um, Einer, I want to ask you about the Chinese economy. We saw the figures two days ago, 4.8% year-on-year growth mm -hmm. in the first quarter. It's not looking great, if, especially if you are considering the fact that much of the growth comes from the first and second months. Well, yeah, I mean, there was definitely a slowdown in the third month, uh, but it did beat expectations, which were at 4.4%. So th there's something good in there. The question is, what is the, the long-term trend? And right anything now, policy, any th policy signals and directions oh, you picked up from the Boal Forum? Oh, yeah. You're definitely going to see uh, some stimulus coming in. Uh, China realizes that they, it's not just domestically within China. But if the Asia region is going to prosper, there's got to be uh, real money on the table. Uh, the, in terms of the Belt and Road Initiative and other initiatives, there's no way you can say, we want you to do it. 60% uh, of the world's economies are now at a point where they're almost 50% of their government revenues are being uh, put towards their debt. And this is at a time when they can, you know, the people can barely afford food and energy. You've seen this in Sri Lanka. You're going to see this throughout the world unless somebody steps up and help. The difficulty is that this is not something China can do alone. It would really behoove the, the G20 to come together. But they, last time they met, they punted. Yeah, well, unfortunately. Um, Kristalina Gorgieva, the managing director of the International Monetary Fund, said that the one thing she was bothered the most was the fragmentation of the world economy. And actually, we saw that, right? The world economic outlook offered by the IMF uh, downsized the economic uh, outlook for 180 of the world's economy. Um, what do you make? Do you share, first of all, do you share Madame Gorgieva's uh, sentiment? Well, this sentiment is uh, something that is really echoed around the world, actually, among economists. And uh, uh, right now, we do see the, quite a sort of uh, a division and, uh, between the, uh, many of the you know, uh, political blocs that are really in the shape. And this will also set up the uh, ideological basis for uh, protectionism and isolation. And now the uh, spikes of the uh, global commodity prices can really hurt a lot more people, and particularly now the acute uh, shortage of grain to those, uh, you know, uh, underdeveloped world is something that is uh, uh, that must be addressed by uh, the whole world. And people look at always, you know, the uh, Ukraine issues, but uh, there are a lot more people who are suffering uh, malignantly uh, over the years. And so uh, it is really a, a very important time for uh, the test of those uh, uh, political responsibility from the major economies and major nations to, to uh, be able to address uh, some of the acute problem instead of uh, only you know, taking care of their own interest that uh, is supposedly to be under threat. I want to yeah. uh, emphasize a point there. Uh, you, you have, we had globalization, we see when it happened, now people are dissatisfied because they perceive that they lost. So you're now seeing regionalization, RCEP, TCPPP. What these are are gathering uh, countries together. And what China and the rest of these nations are doing is talking about being more efficient. Uh, they're already the low-cost providers. They already have huge markets, but they want to drive the, the costs down even further through um, technology, uh, digitalization 4.0, et cetera. When they do that, they're more competitive, which means they're goods and services. And talking about services, trade and services was way up. And this is a watershed because this is really the, the rise of Asia being able to take care of the service side of things is a completely new idea. It had always been that the West is superior and we know how to do services, and we, we will be the ones who do that. Now you're seeing a real sea change. And finally, gentlemen, uh, I want to get to one last question that we have that is really uh, on this. How can China balance its goals of doing grain growth while growing at all, right? If you look at the job numbers, the unemployment numbers, and the obstacles facing the Chinese economy to grow, given the lockdowns, the geopolitical external shocks? 
Well, uh, President Xi actually, when uh, I still remember his uh, when he was uh, there to spoke uh, to speak with the uh, Davos uh, or the uh, uh, World Economic Forum, he said uh, we need to strike a fine balance between economic growth and also the environmental responsibility. Otherwise, we're really climbing the tree for a fish. So, uh, therefore. Uh, it is important to address the uh, current problem. People need to survive, and businesses need to grow before they have, you know, the full blue sky. Uh, this is very practical approach. But uh, China is really making tremendous amount of efforts to reduce those uh, heavy pollutant industries and also trying to convert uh, the you know digital economy into real productivity and also to provide more decent jobs to those youngsters. I know. Um, I, I'd agree. I mean, China is trying to provide a different model. And people should be keep in mind that China always sticks to its goals. I mean, they'll do a lot. So when they say, as you said, that there's going to be have to be short-term adjustments, what they then do is put the planning in to achieve the end goals. So you, you can expect a, a lot of, you know, there's a lot of talk about the green economy, how that is going to uh, be beneficial. Uh, it's a balance uh, between these things, achieving the long-term goals, but people have to eat in the meantime. Already, uh, Professor Liu and Einer, thank you so much. Always thank great you. to have you with us. We hope we can do more of these face-to-face -face discussions soon. And I want to thank our viewers for tuning in to The Hub on CGTN. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. Thank you for watching. Our news coverage continues on CGTN.